Welcome to the first episode of Series 44, everyone. It's October, and our schedule is all over the place right now because I am in the process of moving, packing a house, and uh, just recently transitioning to a new position with more responsibilities at work, uh, which has made things a lot more interesting uh, in my life. Never a dull moment. Things have been a lot lately. Yeah. Uh, I, I know for both of us, and uh, getting things organized for the show has been a lot on top of that. Yeah, yeah. I think this time of year is like always a lot for everybody. Like September is like back to school, and then mm -hmm. you know, you're moving. I had my hand surgeries, and then I had a really fun reaction to my third COVID shot. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just like life, you know. It's doing it's, it's, like, it's just doing life things. It's doing so life things. Yeah, we're a little behind, but that's okay. It's fine. Um, fear not, things should get better after November. Mm -hmm. um, we're both feeling a lot of burnout while we're trying to hit all of our commitments and things. Um, it's hard, but we'll get there. Thank mm. you so much for your patience as we navigate the next few months. Hopefully there's nowhere to go but up. Absolutely. <laughs> I feel like I've been saying that for two years, but that's okay. We're getting, we're getting to that point. <laughs> Yay. Uh, having said all of that, uh, you will notice that the schedule will be a bit off through November. Uh, we have this series premiering today, obviously, uh, but we will also have a spotlight episode coming up somewhere in the middle uh, that we're going to be recording soon. Um, and we also will likely take a break for November, uh, with my move and a catacon. I don't think there's any way that we can reasonably record anything, uh, for November at this point. Uh, but we should be able to line something up for December. So stay tuned. Yeah, definitely. And we are doing a paddle panel at a catacon. So hopefully we can kind of get something out from that and maybe put that out on the regular feed. Mm -hmm. Um, cause those are always a good time. So don't worry, there'll still be some stuff out there. We're not going to just disappear for a month. Um, Absolutely. But just with the way life has been and, you know, um, obviously some things take priority. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, setting up your children's bedrooms and things Absolutely. like that when you move <laughs> uh, are more important than recording. So mm -hmm. we'll get there. Um, with that out of the way, we do have some announcements. Right now, the Kickstarter for Iron Edda Reforged is in its final week and needs your help to fund. Mm -hmm. It's an ambitious Kickstarter with some really great goals that involve producing phenomenal actual play content um, with extraordinarily talented people. So please check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, this Thursday, our very own Ryan Bolter, you may have heard of him, <laughs> will be demoing a session with Tracy Barnett and Gannon Reedy from the Neoscum podcast. Mm -hmm. This will be streamed on the One Shot Twitch stream, so definitely check that out and back the Kickstarter. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to that. And and here's a spoiler. Um, I'm going to try to recreate our original Iron Etta, my original Iron Etta character. Ooh. Um, with the uh, the romance of the of the bones, I guess. I don't know. That yeah, the weird. bone bonded, like the romance yeah. with the giants and everything. Mm -hmm. Very yeah, I think cool. That'll be really interesting to Very explore cool. and play. So I'm excited for that. Uh, but that should be it for now. Check back with us here after the show for our call to action. Uh, but in the meantime, enjoy our first Call of Cthulhu episode, everyone. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan. In this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome James Kakir, a member of the digital content team at Chaosium and one of the cast on the Chaosium stream of Chaos on Twitch every week. James, welcome to Character Creation Cast. We are very excited you are here. I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. 
can you let everyone know a little bit more about yourself, where they can find you, what kind of stuff you're up to? Yeah, sure. So I work for Chaosium, as has been mentioned. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, where you can also keep up with some of the other work I do. Uh, I'm in the video game sector, so I do a little bit of uh, work for a variety of video game companies, uh, and I also work on some other TTRPG projects from time to time and do a little bit of prose writing. It's fun stuff. Oh, very nice. A little bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go ahead and get into this, and we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? Fantastic. So Call of Cthulhu is a game that I'm very passionate about. So I'm really happy to talk about it. Am I mm -hmm. correct in saying that neither of you have any experience with Call of Cthulhu? Um, I have not played it. I have looked at it a little bit and I have read lots and lots of um, supplements and adventures for it because mm. um, I was one of the NES judges this year. So I got to read a lot of the submissions for that. So <laughs> um, I have a vague familiarity with it, but I have not gotten a chance to play it yet. Oh, phenomenal. Yeah, this, this is my first exposure uh, to Call of Cthulhu, um, the RPG, uh, but no, no stranger to the Cthulhu mythos uh, for at least 20, 20 years or so, um, <laughs> my, my friends and I have been kind of obsessed with, uh, the board games and whatnot sur surrounding that mythos. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So you're, you're on top of the source material. There are some great board games out there, uh, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. So, and you've read the A's submissions, so you're on top of the uh, top tier of content that's out there. So, <laughs> yes, great. yes. I think one of them won Best Adventure this year, didn't it? Uh, I, I should know that. I, be I believe it was, Han I think, Hand of Glory. Yes, was yes, one of the, by uh, Alan one of the Carey. Mm -hmm. Type 40, yeah, Very fantastic. Cool. Yeah, uh, absolutely fantastic scenario, and all of the uh, Seeds of Terror range are really great stuff. Anyway, um, Call of Cthulhu, so... As if you've never been uh, introduced to it before, and just in case you're not familiar with the Cthulhu <laughs> mythos, we'll go right from the start. So Call of Cthulhu is a game of cosmic horror. So it's a tabletop role-playing game that is focused on dealing with these existential threats that are beyond the comprehension of humanity and that beholding them will drive you entirely insane and you are but insects uh, before the vast powers of the cosmos. You play as investigators in a variety of historical settings, the most common of which is the 1920s, and you work together to try and foil the plots of cultists who are trying to bring about the end of the world by summoning these eldritch beings or work to uh, disrupt the schemes of strange mad scientists who are putting together bodies that they're stealing from the graveyard to animate and eat the locals of some rural town. It's that sort of story <laughs> and it's that sort of adventure. In Call of Cthulhu, you tend to be very frail uh, as opposed to a lot of more combat-focused tabletop role-playing games. So you really want to <laughs> avoid getting into fights where you can. When you get, come up against one of those Eldritch Horror-style things, there's no way you're going to be able to fight against them. So you just have to be ready to run. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the, the Cthulhu mythos uh, has been kind of uh, resurging in pop culture as well with like Lovecraft Country. Mm -hmm. uh, being so popular. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that it ever, like, all the way wasn't popular. Right. I think it's a thing that it's had a lot of staying power. Oh, yeah. Um, it's been around for, for quite a while. I, I can't remember when uh, H.P. Lovecraft wrote the, the original mythos, um, but it was uh, probably, what, 20s, 30s, give or take? You know, I'm going to embarrass myself and probably get the exact year wrong, but yes, it was in the uh, 20s. Uh, he was writing all throughout that period, uh, as were many contemporaries who also contributed to the Cthulhu mythos. And now we have this great, huge wealth of uh, cosmic horror that all these different uh, writers and artists and content creators have contributed to, uh, leading up to where we are now a century later with a huge wealth of content to draw from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm really surprised that I haven't gotten to play these games yet because it has like all of the the stuff that I like which is you know sort of the more investigation heavy like a little bit lower on the combat side you know frail characters that kind of stuff but I think maybe it's because I like to be the one raising the dead 
as opposed to <laughs> trying to put a stop to that. So maybe that's why I'm just like, I see that I'm on the wrong side. I'm like, no thanks. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Yeah, Call of Cthulhu is one of the kind of great classic tabletop role-playing games. It's been around since 81. It's actually going to be the 40th anniversary of Call of Cthulhu this year. So that's yeah. exciting. That's very exciting. Well, uh, what sort of tools do we need to play uh, Call of Cthulhu? Okay, so you're going to need your standard suite of typical tabletop role-playing game supplies. So paper and a pencil, uh, you'll need a character sheet, uh, and there are some character sheet resources online that you can find. I think that you have a couple of them ready to go that we talked about Mm -hmm. just before we started. And apart from that, uh, in terms of dice, you'll need the standard suite to play. Uh, but for this character creation process, we're going to need a D6 and we're going to need a D100. So that is a D10 and a percentile dice. All right. Nice. Beyond that, I love, I love when we get a, to roll oh, dice during character creation. <laughs> it's a bit of fun, isn't it? It is. Uh, beyond that, you just need a a, a willingness to uh, be terrified by by all the horrible things that are sure to happen to your investigator. Uh, Call of Cthulhu <laughs> is very much a game where your character kind of deteriorates over time, and it's all about watching them struggle until at last they uh, retire or are devoured or go mad. Mm-hmm. All right. See, this is this is my kind of game, though. Is that like characters are not. Um, you know, made of stone and can't, you know, they're supposed to fall apart a little bit. Um, I enjoy putting my characters in those kinds of situations <laughs> where where there are stakes to it. And I know that there are a lot of people that like games where they are like the larger than life hero who are kind of invincible and that kind of stuff, um, which totally fine. Have your fun the way you want to have your fun. Um, I like to take my little person and hurt them as much as possible. <laughs> so <laughs> You are going to absolutely love this then. Although for people who are interested in the more heroic fantasy side of things, there is Pulp Cthulhu, which is a supplemental rule set that you can apply to your games of Call of Cthulhu, which allow you to be the kind of heroes of the pulp era where you're running around and uh, able to oh. shoot the monsters a little bit more. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, oh, I like that a lot, that there's like another option for for people. It's a bit of fun. It's got a scaling system inside it called the Pulpometer, where you get to kind of apply <laughs> or not apply rules so you can scale up things to be a bit more uh, difficult or move them down and really land where you think your group is going to fit best. That's awesome. really cool. What kind of stories and themes do you think that this game does best? Stories and themes? Well, the kind of overarching themes of cosmic horror that is the frailty of humanity, the enormity of the cosmos, and a lot of bleak philosophical kind of uh, uh, principles about insignificance are obviously really, really baked into the system. But there's also a couple of other themes that really, really come through. I tend to find that historical atmosphere comes through really, really well. And mm. Call of Cthulhu has a bunch of different settings from the uh, the Wild West to the French Revolution to the Dark Ages, uh, any that you care to mention, where you can really cool. immerse yourselves in these very specific historical milieus uh, and start to feel the unique themes that come through in each one of them. On an overarching theme, you also get... Uh, a sense of investigation, a sense of thrill, a sense of horror, the kind of classic things that you would expect from a game where your characters are so uh, in danger and have to rely on their wits and skill. There's also a sense of camaraderie, I suppose. Facing certain death, you tend to have these fantastic moments between investigators where they'll light a cigarette and drive off uh, towards their own certain doom, knowing that although (laughs) they'll sacrifice themselves, they might just save the world doing it. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Uh, so what do characters then specifically do uh, in this game, the ones that we play? Fantastic. Yeah, your characters in Call of Cthulhu are fundamentally just normal people. So they're referred to as investigators, and they can be from any background and any type of person. And there's nothing inherently special about them. You have a mm. set of beliefs. You have a set of uh, you know special items, special locations, which flesh out your character and give them sort of a soul. But your skills and your abilities are identical to anybody else's that you would come across in the world. In Pulp Cthulhu, you have some 
additional things that you can do and you get things called pulp talents, which lets you uh, have a little bit more style. But the classic Call of Cthulhu experience is really stripped back. Ultimately, there's nothing special about you. You're just one person. And that fits into that hmm. theme of insignificance again, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Technically, you have a set of occupations, which your character is built on, uh, but these aren't like classes. They're very customizable, and all they really do is they help you decide where you're going to assign your skill points. You're not gated by what mm. occupation you are in any major way. Oh, that's pretty cool. What do you think makes Call of Cthulhu unique from other role-playing games, from other sort of investigative role-playing games, um, even other horror role-playing games? That's a good question. I think in general, it is the focus on very, very intense uh, investigation and atmosphere that sets it apart from other tabletop role-playing games. When you come out of playing something like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, uh, Warhammer Fantasy, Starfinder, whatever you want to mention, you're in a mood where you're ready to kind of move from encounter to encounter um, and you're ready to uh, play in what is kind of a rigid story structure where you sort of have these uh, scenes based on social role playing uh, before moving to combat. Perhaps you have some investigation. And I love those games. I'm not, um, you know, knocking them in any way. But Call of Cthulhu mm -hmm. tends to be much more... Uh, you know, dynamic in the way it presents the investigations and the uh, structure of a scenario. You're never really sure what's going to come around the next corner, and you tend mm. to focus on a lot more minor detail. Things, logistical details, like how is your character going to get a train? What are they going to do there? What food will they be served on the train? These really fascinating minor details can form the basis of super engaging gameplay. And in terms, mm -hmm. of, in terms of how it sets it's set apart from other uh, horror, I suppose that other uh, horror tends to provide you with a uh, different perspective in some way. You know, talking about the world of darkness and how those games kind of focus on personal horror or focusing on the alien tabletop role-playing game in which you have this sci-fi setting that changes the dynamic of everything you really mm -hmm. are limited in Call of Cthulhu. You are just you, and you can't really do anything more than a normal person would do in the face of uh, all of the horror that's going to be pushed towards you. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting uh, about the the minor details because when I when I think of like Cthulhu and and like yeah, what what meal are you being served on the train? Um, that could eventually be turned against you in terms of now your meal is part of the horror, uh, from what I understand. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's all these different stories where you'll, you will you always have to be worried about the villain trying to poison you and things like that. But I mm -hmm. think that, you know, in, in, in horror and in, uh, you know, storytelling in general, I think it's very important to have a juxtaposition of what is horrible and what isn't or what is action-packed and what isn't. Mm -hmm. If you have everything at a flat tone throughout the entire story, you tend to uh, lose focus. And in Call of Cthulhu, there is a lot of... Bit slow build. So it's something where you really oh. are given the opportunity to um, gradually scale things up and up and up and up and up until finally uh, everything turns against you and you've realized the enormity of what's going on. I like that. I know a thing I noticed from a lot of the adventures that I read too is that you, you get to a point where, um, you know, you start as a player making these decisions, um, not between like do I, you know, want steak or chicken? Um, and it starts to be like, do I want bad or worse? Um, and I really, I really enjoyed the way that you talked about that, like that it kind of scales up because I think if everything is horror all the time, there's a sort of fatigue or even a sort of like tolerance built up to it. Um, and the way that it, it kind of moves along and progresses till you get to a point where like, you know, you have to make these decisions of like, okay, is it me or everyone else? And, mm -hmm. you know, like, is it really bad thing now or like maybe okay thing, but forever? And it's these really <laughs> tough kind of gray area decisions that I really enjoy. Absolutely. And that gets even more dynamic when you talk about longer campaigns. Call of Cthulhu mm -hmm. is absolutely a game system that 
has a very different feel between your one-shot story and your long, overarching uh, mega campaign. Oh, yeah. You know, you've got these scenarios, or these campaigns rather, like Horror on the Orient Express uh, and Mask of the Aliathotep, which you're expected to play for an enormous amount of time with a huge number of sessions and bring these intense arcs of character development. You just can't keep the horror at uh, at, a, at 90, you know, <laughs> dialed up all the way right. for all that time because, you know, for one, your characters are going to die, but also the emotional beats just aren't there. <laughs> so you have these really fascinating ways that the story kind of has these peaks of troughs in terms of horror, in terms of action. And I think that that builds a great sense of dread throughout the entirety mm. of the mm-hmm. large campaigns. Speaking of of the campaigns and the scenarios, I think that one of the other things that sets Call of Cthulhu apart, um, in my mind, and obviously I'm going to be a little bit biased here as someone who, who's, who's written for Call of Cthulhu, <laughs> but I think that sure. there's a um, a real a, 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 a real mastery of the scenario writing craft that is baked into the game. So you have these fantastic uh, pre-written campaigns, pre-written stories that you can get access to. And of course, there are plenty of fantastic uh, pre-written campaigns and pre-written stories out there for every system. But Call of Cthulhu Mm -hmm. has been really hitting these fantastic beats for many, many years and is definitely one of the um, strong uh, players in that game of pre-written scenarios. Very cool. Speaking of uh, the history of Call of Cthulhu, uh, this is usually the point where we pull up the Wikipedia article and uh, spout off all sorts of facts about the game. To make it look um, like we know exactly what we're talking about. No, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting because, uh, uh, yeah, when I when I went to do the research on this, uh, it looks like it was originally going to be a game called Dark Worlds back in the the very early '80s um, that was commissioned by Chaosium, but that one was never published. Uh, but then that eventually turned into what is now known as Call of Cthulhu, which came out in 1981. Uh, which I was just a wee one-year-old at that point. But uh, goodness, 40 years. That's that's a wild uh, amount of years for this to have been around because that's, that's at the infancy almost of RPGs in general. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's definitely a game that's had a long history and it's been through a lot of hands in the time that it has uh, developed. I'm actually not the greatest expert on the early stages of the uh, Call of Cthulhu story. Um, I was born in 94, so I'm, uh, you mm-hmm. know, I, I was... Uh, uh, I know, like Ryan's saying, like, oh, I was only a one-year-old, and I was like, I wasn't born yet, but even I was an 88, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, so I, I, I kind of... Um, didn't uh, learn about Cthulhu until I was old enough to play it, really, because you don't want to throw right, it yeah. in straight it's away. It's not for children. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> mean, there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, there, we've got the um, uh, Cthulhu for beginning readers range, which you can grab, which is just this fantastic uh, uh, set, of, set of books that are, are, are a bit of a laugh. But yeah, in general, um, it's it's a little more PG. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Ryan and I were planning on setting up a playgroup oh, for, you know, <laughs> ages 5 to 10. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's been a lot of editions that came out since 1981, and I think we're on the 7th edition, is that right? That's right. The current edition is the 7th edition of the game. Um, and there's not a huge difference between each uh, subsequent edition. You can transpose them relatively easily. They're all built on Chaosium's BRP system. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's a pretty universally usable, uh, you know, recognizable system, and it adjusts relatively well between iterations. Very cool. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of supplements like we were talking about as well, uh, which is exciting, especially if the the system doesn't change much. Over the years, you've got like decades of supplemental material that'll be easy to translate, uh, which is really cool. Absolutely. And the, uh, you know, Chaosium has has made an effort to bring and update some of that material for 7th edition and not just for the, you know, small changes in rules, but also mm-hmm. making updates to the story and, uh, you know, making changes mm-hmm. that make the game uh, more modern and more dynamic and more exciting. And there's still a huge amount of content uh, that was created decades ago, which is fantastic. And uh, we might see someday brought forward. And there's also amazing stuff being written now. So, yeah, check out some of those uh, those pre-written campaigns. They're a lot of fun. 
Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, I will say, like, even just from what I read doing the Ennies stuff, um, there's just so much out there that I think if you wanted to get into the game and you weren't, you know, you're the kind of person like me that you're like, I don't know where to start in writing an adventure or anything like that. Like, there's lots of really accessible places to kind of dip your toes in and try out things mm -hmm. um, and, you know, pretend as a GM that you just had like such brilliant ideas and, <laughs> you know, like you're an endless font of one shot or campaign ideas. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff. And I think that um, in general, I, 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 when I first came into tabletop role-playing games, I think that I sort of had this odd perspective where I thought, I'm going to make everything up myself. Why would I read a uh, pre-written story? And I've now realized that there's this fantastic art in, you know, translating a pre-written story into a game and uh, how mm -hmm. you really don't lose creativity playing something uh, pre-written. In fact, it's a very dynamic experience. I still love making my own stories, but I love playing from pre-written as well. Both can be really exciting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I remember my my experience with pre-written adventures uh, dates back to the Palladium uh, Heroes Unlimited days. Uh, of course, I know uh, I rolls from Amelia because obligated and sigh every you time know. Ryan mentions Heroes Unlimited. <laughs> it's fine, but uh, you know, back then we were we were teenagers and we didn't know we didn't have the like uh, the creative uh, energy to to morph what was in the adventure itself. So uh, there might be a lot of people out there with the concept of if it's written as a pre written adventure, I I cannot deviate from what's yeah. in the book, but that's just simply not true. For sure. You want to be applying your own creativity. And I have played pre-written campaigns under different GMs that completely morphed and were unrecognizable depending on who's running them. And you can transpose mm -hmm. setting, you can transpose time, you can do all kinds of exciting things. It's really just a great way to spark ideas. And if you do want to rely on some of the stuff that's written there, it's really, really fantastic uh, in terms of assisting you with prep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Gives you a nice little like stepping stone into things hmm. um, as you're as you're first getting going too. For sure. I mean, that said, there's, you know, uh, a range of options for everybody out there. There are some pre-written scenarios that throw you into a setting that is so complex and so difficult that you have to do more prep to make sure that you're across the several appendices <laughs> right. of information <laughs> about all of these interesting details. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I know, I know lots of people who love that kind of stuff who are like, I'm just going to like dive all in to this. And I've played games that are like that, that have like so much lore and so much research involved. And sometimes that's fun. And then sometimes you're like, mm, no, I would just like it to be uh, here and now. And <laughs> I just mm -hmm. want to step in and be done. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it does have a little bit of something for everybody. Before we jump into our actual character creation, let's cover a couple like basic terms and concepts that people might need to know um, so that when we say words, they're not like, but um, we made notes of a couple um, characteristics. Can you explain what yes, those are? So your characteristics are the basic uh, statistics about your investigator that, uh, that, that don't change. They're the static determiners like your strength, your dexterity, these things that give you a sense of the person. Of course, they can change and um, uh, particularly <laughs> uh, nasty characters. Uh, Call of Cthulhu scenarios tend to have a habit of you drink a strange potion and suddenly your size drops and you'll shrink into nothingness. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they tend to be the uh, more static descriptors. The base stats, if you will. Sure. Um, skill mechanics. Yes, yeah, so your skill mechanics, these are what your investigator is talented at, the abilities they have and really how they interact with the world. Your skills are what allow you uh, to solve problems presented to you. These are things like spot hidden, brawl, stealth, climb, swim, library use, uh, accounting, archaeology, whatever you might <laughs> mention. And of course, there's blank spaces for you to insert custom ones if you should choose so. Interesting. Uh, now I see it as a percentile-based skill system. Yeah. Um, how, how does how does the rolling work for that? Absolutely. So the percentile-based system works. You have a 
number, a value in each skill. And that number will be something like, 5, 25, 50, 70, whatever you would care to mention. And when you want to make a skill check, you roll your percentile die, that is your D100, and you are trying to roll under the skill that, uh, that under the value of the skill. So if you have a 70 in something, you're rather good at it. You are going to succeed in mm-hmm. it 70% of the time. And when you make the roll, uh, as long as you roll from 1 to 70, you have succeeded. Interesting. It gets a little more complicated when you start to add things like tiers of success. So technically, if you roll under half of your value, so let's say that you have a 70 in a skill and you roll a 35 or under, that's called a hard success. You've done particularly well. You've rolled well under your skill. And you can see that that becomes more likely the higher your skill Mm -hmm. is. If you roll under a fifth of your skill, uh, you actually get an extreme success. Um, And if you roll a 0-1, uh, so one in a hundred chance that is a critical. Those are the four uh, tiers of of success that you can have. Oh wow! And then above the skill uh, is just failure. Are there different bands of failure at all? You can technically get what's called a fumble, which is kind of like a critical fail. Uh, fumbles mm-hmm. start at ninety six, but they become rarer as you get better. So if your skill gets over fifty, uh, the fumble range actually shrinks. Uh, making it more difficult to fumble. Uh, but in generally, a fumble is a 96 to a 100, and something disastrous happens in those cases. But apart from that, everything else is just a fail uh, in some variation. For reference, oh, nice. uh, a, a professional tends to have anywhere from about uh, 30 to 70 in a skill. Um so that you can be, you that's kind of the range if you go up to a, you know, an accountant, they'll have somewhere in that sort of scale, you know, a bell curve towards the middle. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if you start getting uh, below that, you can be like a hobbyist or, you know, an amateur, have an interest. And if you start getting above that, you start to become, you know, a real expert. If you hit 90 in anything, be that a characteristic or a skill, you are amongst uh, the best uh, in the world. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Um, sanity. This is one of the big things in this system. Absolutely. Can you talk us through that? Yes. Um, so your sanity in Call of Cthulhu is basically a measure of uh, how damaged your character has been by exposure to the Cthulhu mythos and to the terrible, horrible things that lurk beyond the veil of space and time. Um In recent editions of Call of Cthulhu, we've really tried to divorce the idea of sanity from its, uh, you know, attachment to mental health and, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, mental health experiences. Uh, In in the context we're using it here, it really is uh, your character's comprehension of the incomprehensible and their understanding of these uh, malign forces that just uh, destroy the human mind when they are beheld. Mm -hmm. You gradually lose sanity over time as you're exposed to more and more of the terrible things that lurk out there in the Cthulhu mythos. And if you lose a significant enough bump at a a single time or a significant enough amount in a single day, uh, you can have a bout of madness, which means that you can temporarily lose control of your character and things like that. It's similar to getting, Mm -hmm. losing a lot of health in a single burst and you, you know, fall unconscious, things like that. Okay. Interesting. You can also regain sanity uh, by defeating the monsters and managing to put right the world. You can also regain sanity by getting a skill over 90 that represents you mastering so acutely an element of the human experience that it provides some context, it provides some logic uh, in this crazy chaotic world of ours. Interesting. I like that. Are there any other concepts or things that you want to highlight before we jump into the character creation portion. I think there's a couple of things like damage build, uh, you know, magic points, things like that. But those will become clear as we jump into the character creation itself. So I'd say, mm-hmm. yeah, let's let's go right ahead. All right. Are, are we ready to make some people? All right. All right. Well, let's let's make some people. Let's make some people. Let's do it. All right. Fantastic. So um, what I will request that you both do is pop open the Keeper's Rulebook. Uh, that has all of the information that you need on it. Jump to page 30, which is the creating investigators section. You can have the investigators handbook open as well if you'd like, but we're going to focus primarily on what's inside the keeper's rulebook. I'm also not going to go directly through uh, 
you know, reading these sections, I'm going to sort of guide you through the process the way that I tend to do it, which might get a bit yeah. uh, different, but let's do it. So uh, we start off by generating our characteristics. And this is a really great way to get a sense of your character. If you are somebody with really, really high strength, you can start to think about why that might be. If you are somebody who is has really, really low constitution, you might think, oh, you know, is my is my character, you know, potentially injured? Is that something that I might fold into their story? Gives you all these opportunities mm. to uh, flesh them out. There are a couple of optional ways that you can... Um, guide the generation of characteristics so that you get a investigator that suits you better and those are explained um, at the end of the chapter there's also a couple of homebrew rules but in general we'll stick raw for this one so what i'll get everybody to do is grab a d6 and you are going to first of all go to your strength and you are going to roll 3d6 and times it by five Ooh. I'm going to have to get out uh, a couple more D6s here. Well, you could uh, just roll the same one three times. I don't... I, I've got so many dice here. i got to use them. I know. Them, I, right? have the, I have the jar. <laughs> I, all the little ones yep. are on top because my daughter likes to use them as math counters. Oh, lovely. There you go. Um, which we have a whole box of math counters, um, but she likes the dice jar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the well, dice are much better uh, in, in all instances. Right. Yeah. I mean, I can't blame her for that. So I've got three different D sixes from different dice sets: one metal and two pal- or uh, oh, I hate that. Metal. I hate you know that. why? Because chaos. Oh, no, um, chaos. No. Perfect. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to focus on having some stability in the world, and we're going to use three of the same dice here uh, that I believe are stolen from my ex husband. There you go. So I got a twelve. So they're for sure lucky. <laughs> And it looks like we multiply that by five. Yeah, exactly. Oh no! Don't worry. Low the low characteristics don't necessarily mean uh, they're not bad. It in fact it adds some like <laughs> dynamic quality uh, to your investigator. So, I got a two, a two, and a one. Oh, brilliant! Oh, That's no. fantastic. <laughs> uh, now I have to now I have to do math. Uh, so you got uh, so twenty five strength for two, a two, and a one. I ended up with seventy, so I've done pretty well. So I got 60 for mine. 60. Okay. So, and we're just going down the line for uh, uh, the first four. Is that right? uh, So we are going down the line. You'll do strength. You'll do constitution. uh, You'll do dexterity. So we'll keep rolling through there. For reference, I like to think of uh, any skill that is outside the 30 to 70 range as a defining skill. This isn't uh, mechanized in Call of Cthulhu, but I use it as an element to really define my investigator and to give them some detail. So with a strength of 25, you might decide to make that a major component of what your character is about. Interesting. Oh, and and I'm just rolling fantastically, coming in for con of uh, 65. Ooh. I just got uh 14. Oh, see, yeah, my con is like uh let's see here. What is this? 16 times 5. So, going through each of the characteristics, I'll, I'll talk to each one a little bit. Strength, sure. obviously, strength that is your character's um uh physical strength, uh you know, how their muscle power, how much they can lift, how much they can carry. It's most often mm-hmm. used for breaking through doors in Call of Cthulhu tends to be the uh the uh, most common usage. It also determines your damage sense. build, uh which is going to uh, determine how much damage you do when you hit things. Um your constitution uh is your physical health. Um uh, and that will determine how much you can resist poisons, uh, how much you can resist harmful environmental effects, things like that. It also determines your health. Your dexterity is your balance. It also uh, is the determining factor in your initiative, uh, how quickly you go, and also will determine your dodge skill, which is very, very important, particularly when you're fighting the giant monsters uh, that are going to be trying to eat you. All of those are 3d6 times 5, so when... Uh, You've both gotten through that. I'll introduce the last couple of skills we're going to roll on. Sure. So I've got strength, constitution, and dex we were rolling for, right? That's to start with, yes. So I got uh, 60, 50, and 50. 60, 50, 50. Good. Nice, rounded character. That's pretty good. Yeah. I got 25, 80, and 50. Oh, my God. So 80 (laughs) is huge. So I'm really weak, (laughs) but... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're, well, yeah, you're, so you're incredibly hardy, incredibly endurant. You just don't have, like, you know, a lot of f- 
physical strength uh, in terms of right. muscle. Mm-hmm. But you could, you, this, like, I have like a great immune system, yeah, well, but I can't lift anything. I mean, if you wanted to play an athlete, you could be like a marathon runner or something like that. Or you could oh, be yeah. a marathoner or something. Um, so you've got a couple of options there. So next up, we're going to roll two characteristics that uh, maybe don't make as immediate sense. We're going to roll um, APP for appearance and POW, P-O-W for power. So your APP is uh, kind of your character's personal magnetism, uh, their uh, appearance in terms of you know how how much uh, they're able to uh, be charming. It doesn't necessarily mean how physically attractive you are. Um, it might just mean that people really get along with you and really tend to uh, uh, dig your vibe. All kinds of things like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. To your gravitas. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's three d six times five as well. And then your Mm -hmm. power, this is your force of will. This is uh, your, uh, you know, ability to cling to your sanity in the face of terrible things. Um, It is your ability uh, to cast spells very critically in the Mm. rare case that you get magic, which is not a given in Call of Cthulhu. And uh, it's a very dangerous thing to start messing with. Um, There are professions of the game like cult leader and musician. both of those use power as a defining uh, characteristic. Okay. Oh, wow. I've come up with a 13 on appearance. So that's 65. Get to roll below a... Oh, no, I guess I did. All right. So I got 70 for appearance and 55 for power. It's not, not bad. bad at all. I got 60 for appearance and only a 35 for power. Oh, no. Your, your uh, dreams of uh, magical no! domination. Ryan. No, Ryan. <laughs> I decided I don't like this game now. <laughs> no, fear because you can actually there's 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 special ways you can increase your power during play. Of course, it may require mm. you to delve into some more eldritch tomes, but I'm sure that you'll be. Oh, totally see, fine. there it is. Just kidding. This is the uh. game for me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Am I supposed to touch things that you're not supposed to touch, and then I can get more powerful? Because yep. I'm definitely going to do that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so next up is uh, your size um and this is uh your physical physical bulk your height um uh your mass whatever you uh want to do and this is basically scalable once again it's kind of it's it's an abstraction so you can be really really tall or you can be really really stocky um whatever you should choose um this is 2d6 plus 6 rather than just a straight 3d6 so i got 13 times 5 again i'm assuming no, 2d6 plus 2D, 6. Oh, is it just 2d6 plus, plus 6? And then times 5 it again. Okay. Yeah, you sorry. I, I should have okay. made that clear. 2d6 Perfect. plus 6 times 5. You would think that I would be getting used to these multiplications. Uh, they get ingrained in your head eventually. I know. 65 uh, for my size. And it looks like I, I've got the, the character sheet that autofills Brilliant. things for you. And it looks like the power autofilled my magic points. Great. And the size auto-filled my hit points. Perfect. So that's neat. Why is my size also 80? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and you are going to be able to survive yeah, a lot of a lot You're of just gunshots. A, <laughs> just a tank. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, then uh, after doing your size, uh, we are going to do uh, intelligence and education. Um, intelligence is as it sounds, and education uh, is... Not necessarily your like education in a in a specific facility. It's not how many degrees you have or whatever, but it represents your mastery of your job uh, and the training that you've received in your craft. So this mm. might be you know you might have never gone to a specific educational facility, but you might be very very on top of. Um, you know, well, you know, the, the, what you do and be very well trained in your profession, um, and that yeah. represents a high education. Yeah. And what are we rolling for those? The same 3d6? Uh, three, uh, this is these are both 2d6 t- uh, plus 6 times 5. Oh, okay. Yep. There is a, a, a general guide for education if you would like to say that your character is somebody who uh, went through the sort of traditional academic route. Um, and that uh, means that if you are around... Uh, uh, 60, you are a high school graduate. 70, you've been to college a little bit. Um, with 80, you've kind of done some graduate work and you've completed a you know a postgraduate degree and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, 
90 might you you start to get start to get real real impressive there <laughs> <laughs> nice uh i got 70 for my intelligence and 65 for my education Brilliant. good scores yeah my lowest one is 50 and that's both con and dex <laughs> no my intelligence i got 70 and then i got 65 for my education so. oh nice brilliant that's not bad you just finished my roll um i just can't lift anything <laughs> okay fantastic so now that we've determined our characteristics uh we are going to uh, decide on a couple of other key points and it's good that the uh, sheet has automatically filled out a few details we can technically roll our luck here uh but i like to leave mm. that for the end as like a final little uh flair to add to the character All right. now the typical things to decide uh, a, a basic overview for our character in your head have a think about what your character who your character might be um what profession they might have what their life might be like uh and then the next decision we make is their age so that mm-hmm. will uh, determine a few factors for reference um as your character you gets older um uh they can gain additional education um uh and uh as they get uh significantly older they will start to take penalties uh to their physical attributes so their strength their con their decks and such interesting so now it's uh it's worth noting uh that uh we have downloaded the 1920s era investigator sheets uh, so I'm assuming we're going to be uh, people within the 1920s yes, the era. Classic, the classic mm-hmm. Call of Cthulhu setting. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so trying to figure out what will be in that era uh, is going to be interesting. If you'd like, if you if you don't quite have any ideas, we can start to roll on the um, backgrounds table. Uh, and these are elements Ooh, yeah. that can they, 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 technically you do them after, but you can, you can do this in any order. So why don't we jump across to that instead? Um Flip over to the back of your character sheet or scroll down if you're using a a digital version and you will see that there is a lot of slots for uh, your character's backstory. Let's start off by looking in the ideology and belief one and I'll say grab your D10 and make a roll and there is a table there uh, and you can get one of the items within it. So, for example, I rolled a five uh, with the, the prompt for which is uh, member of a secret society, e.g. Freemasons, Women's Institute, or Anonymous. Oh, okay. It looks like this is on page 43 of the book. Um, so I rolled a six. There is an evil in society that should be rooted out. What is that evil? Oh, interesting. So these are these are answers personal to our characters exactly right? so the and you know you they're, they're prompts so you work with them to kind of figure out your, mm-hmm. uh, your, your what you want to actually put down and as you go forward so ideology is the first one and then you continue to move through so significant people is the next one um and you roll 2d10 for this the first is deciding who your significant person is um and the second one is deciding what your relationship to them is so for example if i roll 2d10 here i rolled a 10 so uh i would get um, a non-player character NPC in the game asked the keeper to pick one for you, and uh, let's let's re-roll that because uh, we don't have a keeper here with us. Um, I rolled a sibling for my for my second one, and my second D10, mm. I got a four, which says you wronged them and seek reconciliation. So I have you know a a a, a brother that that I that I let get thrown into jail instead of me to take the heat or something like that. Oh, very cool. So what did you get for your ideology uh amelia i got a belief in fate Ooh, that's interesting i know see now i'm trying to like fill it in the actual fillable one but my keyboard is so loud so i might go back to writing it and then fill it in <laughs> later i just wanted to do that i wanted it to do the math part for me oh. <laughs> no just uh y- you can type that's fine i'll 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 get rid of it that's so much more editing for you clicky clack clicky clack no it's I fine know. i know i should have done it on like a quiet keyboard Okay. Oh, I see. So on the significant people, you roll a D10 to figure out who it is, and then another D10 to see kind of what it was, what the relationship is, right? Awesome. So I got sibling as well. Perfect. Well, you know, Uh, you can, um, you can, you can stick it six, just uh, take the same one, and I'm sure that we'll get something different. What did you get for your, uh, your second? Uh, A feeling of regret. Ah, 
Uh, example, Ooh. you should have died in their place. You felt or you fell out over something you said. Uh, you didn't step up and help them when you had the chance. Interesting. You can. I got a fellow investigator. Fantastic. Oh. Um, and it says uh, you seek to prove yourself to them. Ooh. How? <laughs> example by finding a good job, by finding a good spouse, by getting an education. <laughs> I'll show you. I'm going to get married to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be great. Exactly. Call to action. Yeah, like that. I enjoyed the Call of Cthulhu stuff so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, unfortunately, prior to this, had never gotten to really do a lot with it other than than reading stuff mm -hmm. like i said in the episode but um oh gosh i'm really itching to play it i now. know i know i i didn't anticipate the amount of connection i i had to to my character and you'll find that out next episode uh but but goodness the 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 detail we were able to put into these characters uh just from the backgrounds alone was was really interesting yeah, I mean, and I, I I, knew that, like, there was definitely some investigation stuff, and it was like, that's kind of my jam, but I don't mm -hmm. think I realized how much, like, this game is, like, exactly my kind of garbage. Yeah. So I really, I'm hoping I can get <laughs> to play it at some point. I know. So, yeah, um, st stay tuned. Uh, for the next episode is going to be great, and uh, I think the discussion is going to be great, too, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out shortly. We haven't discussed it yet. No, we have not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, for our first and biggest call to action right now is to check out the Iron Ada Reforged Kickstarter that is going on right now. It is a cyberpunk twist on Norse mythology where you rise up as multiple characters to defeat the Norse gods and their evil corporations, uh, which is so interesting because you, you character hop as yeah. a mechanic of game play, uh, which just blows my mind. Yes. Um, this also funds two fantastic actual plays, one video stream series and one podcast series, uh, both with phenomenal casts that absolutely deserve to get paid for their work. Um, just just check it out if you haven't yet, because it's 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 a really good game. Next up, thank you to everyone for all of your patience as we work our way through life stuff and our slightly unusual schedule for the next month and a half. We will have our full series this month, just in time for Halloween. Mm -hmm. Um but obviously starting a bit late, as you've noticed. So stick around. We will keep releasing episodes and we will be back to like a regular schedule before you know it. I promise. Absolutely. Uh, but before we go, we have one last call to action. Uh, if you want to help us out and help us feel amazing, uh, try leaving us a rating and review. Uh, we will be able to read out your five-star review right here in the call to action. And thank you personally for it, like we are about to do for this review from Hawklord2112 on Podchaser. They said, so I clicked into CCC following an ad on OneShot. I was not disappointed. By taking a formulaic approach to the show, given a brief analysis of the system, then character generation, and then discussion of advancement and what stories can be told with those characters. CCC provides a balanced set of review this game without reviewing this game. <laughs> if you're struggling with a new game you've bought, this podcast is a terrific guide to the core of any game, the characters. The addition of the guests keeps things fresh and interesting. I'd love to hear more Jeff and John, by the way. And the wide variety of games used means there's sure to be something for everyone. Well, thank you so much. Um, we love Jeff and John and their ability to torment me. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> I believe there was a, a joke in the one shot discord actually about doing a specific episode of just the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how that would only be fun <laughs> if I was there. So uh, it's, it's true. Uh, we would probably have to pay you to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, but you uh, know a new what? New one shot Patreon goal. I know, <laughs> Get right? Amelia to sit through Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Uh, yeah. it, it should be fun. But uh, really, it, if we don't want to torture you that much, we could just go with After the Bomb Second Edition. And you know, it'd be about the same thing. Uh, mm, only without the branded better, content. 
How? Okay. You take because away it's the branding. Co- the copyright infringement was really what was bothering me about that. You're right. Yep. That was The rest of it was fine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so now instead of a mutagenic ooze m- mutating everybody, it's genetic engineering and nuclear bombs. Well, as I said, um, when we first discussed it, I would like to know if I can play Teenage Mutant Ninja Pelicans. <laughs> yep. And, and perfectly uh, acceptable, I would imagine. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> That is all we have for today's episode. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Stay safe, drink water, get vaccinated, and keep making those amazing people. We will see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at LordNeptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like A Horror Borealis. A Horror Borealis is an actual play Monster of the Week podcast set in the 1990s in the fictional town of Revenant, Alaska, just south of the nation's least visited national park and way north of everything else. A reclusive small game hunter with a magical secret, a young anarchist librarian with a passion for conspiracy theory, and a sensible park ranger with a strong local book club following find themselves pulled together by common threads woven mysteriously into their past when monsters begin plaguing their tiny community. But they soon discover the things they're fighting run much deeper and much closer to home. Tune in for a story about identity empathy, community, mental illness, and healing, and stay for the beloved local diner.